All right, we have some revisions first. Yep. This is like a two year old revision, but I finally got it done. The 096 160 by 80 color TFT breakout. Um, so much stuff went out of stock, was unavailable, got revised, and it was just like a bit of a chase. But we finally got all the parts to be able to revise it. Um, so this board is very cute. It's, it's basically our smallest TFT, it's a less than one inch diagonal, 160 by 80 pixels. It's IPS, so it's a beautiful display. Uh, and then like stop here because i'll show what oh can you go back to that yeah okay. so i'll just explain what changed so the tft actually was unavailable we couldn't get the tft anymore and so we decided if we're going to redo it we might as well update to a plug-in tft which makes manufacturing so much easier because you, you don't have to solder the tft anymore um so to do that uh one you'll see on the back there's this little plug that goes through the back and then plugs in uh, the pinout and shape and size of the breakout is the same the tft is the same you know resolution um but the initialization code is slightly different basically it's inverted or it's not inverted compared to the previous one so we do have uh updates that we're going to um have for the code so you can select which version of this display if you run the display and you're like hey it's just inverted like the colors are backwards like white is black black is white red is green etc that's why and then um it should look like that and then the other thing is the sd card we're using now a molex it's a very nice micro sd card slot but it's push pull dot push push because there's no there's not enough space for their standard push push which means that you don't push in to pop the sd card out uh you just pull it out so otherwise it's you know basically exactly pin compatible almost exactly code compatible I'm just glad that we finally got this back in stock. And uh, when we have new product photos, we put some of these amazing new quarters, the American Women's Series from the U.S. Mint. Yeah. Other revision. Uh, okay, so that's the that's the still the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the second Oops. revision. So the second revision is um, this color OLED, the 1.27 inch color OLED, uh, which is one of our older products. Yeah. Now got revised. First off, it's got the nice new penguin font. It's a black PCB, and yeah. we've updated to have an iSpy connector on the back. So this is our uh, plug and play way of um, getting uh, connections going. Let me just get a demo. Okay. You're getting a demo. You get a demo. Yeah. Yeah. Nice code. So it's otherwise pin compatible, code compatible. Yes. Yeah, so why don't we go to the overhead? So. For example, I've got my little QSpy board and I've got a little prototype iSpy connector. And then I just um, use this flex cable to connect so it's much easier to connect displays. So as we're revising and updating many of our displays, we're adding when we can um, these 18 pin FPC connectors because it just makes for really easy uh, connection. And uh, nice. yeah, it was like that. Phil B redid the graphics demo. So nice, nice graphics, fonts, colors graphs etc um so otherwise it's exactly the same you know if you were using this display before you'll notice you know it other than the pcb color and font it's the it, you know identical uh, the sd cards in the same slot and everything um but we had we just shoved everything over a little bit uh, to make room for a flex connector so this is the latest in the i spyfication okay. nah. oh and uh you know yeah so more, this is more. my angelou yes okay uh next up next up this is coming soon but uh, i figured i'd put it in the shop because i think people are excited about it it's a little board that you can plug into the back of your cutie pie that gives you a micro sd card it's using that same micro sd card slot we talked about oh. earlier oh. very handy uh, if you want to add more data storage if you want to do data logging to an sd card um i just love those those are cute SD yeah those micro <laughs> sd card slots are just so darn cute <laughs> <laughs> and so they fit perfectly on the back and in this case we put sockets in and we just plug it in but you don't have to you can solder it directly um to the back and then use the spi pins and um one chip select pin and then uh, if you go here you can see the chip select you can uh, by default to use the tx pin because i don't want to use the analog pins because usually you're data logging from analog or you want to use those for something else but you can uh cut that trace and select rx a0 a1 and then that little square jump, you know, little dot at the right hand side. That's the CS pin. So you can always jumper that to some other pin if necessary. All right. Next up. 
Um, okay, we put in a bunch of RP2040 chips, and if you're going to use those RP2040 chips in a design, you probably want some flash memory. And so this is our favorite flash memory, and I like that they put it on top of her hand there. Yeah. It's quarter. Um, this is the uh, Winbond uh, W25Q64JV XGIQ, which is a QSPY enabled. It also can do regular SPY or dual SPY if necessary. 64 megabit, 8 megabyte chip. It comes in a, uh, I think this is called a WSON or an Exxon. I mean, I think it's Exxon size. It's basically hand solderable. It's it's a little bit smaller than SOIC, but it's got the same kind of size and shape. And um, it's, you know, a great, it's, it's a very inexpensive 8 megabyte, 64 megabit flash. We love 8 megabyte. I think it's like enough space that you can have a little storage for files, fonts, images, audio clips. You look. And still have, uh, what did you say? You can do a lot. You can do a lot. I thought you said ULAW. And I'm like, yeah, you can have ULAW files. Yeah. Um, and also <laughs> yeah, that too. I remember downloading yes. ULAW files. Uh, and then um, it That's goes like great with the Raspberry Pi RP2040. So we have it in sets of 10 yeah. and sets of 100 to match the 10 and 100 RP2040 chips. Next up. Okay. Next up, we're going to get uh, some more products from other vendors. Just been out, I've been out for a couple months, but we're back. And so I'm getting back to stocking some cool stuff. So uh, we're doing some experimentations with um, HDMI, DVI output on the RP2040. And I thought, well, let's carry this cool dev board from Pimeroni. This is the Pico DV. Not to be confused with HDMI because HDMI requires a licensing uh, agreement. Uh, this is DVI, which is a uh, free and uh, well-documented protocol that you can plug into displays that have HDMI written on them. Uh, works great for that. The Pico uh, RP2040, if you overclock it and you run some kind of like tweaky code that uses a lot of PIOs, can output DVI signals. Um, and we've done it and we have some demo code we're going to release as well that uses it and we're prototyping on this board. This also has a micro SD slot. It has uh, three buttons. It's got some GPIO. Um, I think the SD card looks like you can do SDIO as well as SPI. Um, and it's got, uh, you know, like a enable jumper maybe. It's got a couple of things going on there. Uh, if you want to do some AV hacking with the RP2040, you just plug your Pico in. Um, no solder required to use this if you use a Pico with headers pre-attached. Next up. Uh, next up, we've also got the same version of that, basically the same as that board, but this one's got a uh, VGA connector. Uh, and look at how skinny that VGA connector is. That's like the skinniest VGA connector on the planet. That really, <laughs> that's kind of scary. Um, same thing, you want to hack your uh, displays, but it, it's an older display maybe. It doesn't have uh, DVI or HDMI written on it. Uh, has VGA written on it? Congratulations. You can use this instead. Video graphics array. Yeah. I mean, it's still doing the same thing where you get, you don't get as many colors, I don't think, because um, you, I think it does like a averaging between two or three pixels. So you get like maybe eight bit color. Still uh, like black and beautiful. You can also do black and white. Um, right. Good for hacking on AV projects. Next up. Uh, next up, uh, we sell in the shop various LoRa boards, breakouts, feathers, etc. Uh, but maybe you want to go to space and uh, send uh, LoRa signals to and from your space balloon. Um, then, in, in honor of uh, the uh, Challenger, you can pick up one of our LoRa radio boards, so uh, radio modules. This is just the module. Um, it has inside of it the SX1276. It's tuned for about 900 megahertz. You know, basically in software, you can set it to 915 or 868. It's, it's gonna, you're gonna get totally fine signal either way. Um, and that's the ISM band. You would uh, use, we have um, in CircuitPython and I think MicroPython also and Arduino all have libraries for the SX1276 chipset inside. You connect an antenna to the uh, antenna pin connect power and all the signals to the other pins and you basically have a uh, LoRa transceiver. Now it's a little tougher to use in our module that has level shifting power supply antenna connector but if you're designing your own board these are hand solderable um, so we're, we put them in the shop so people can design their own boards. Next up. Next up it's coming soon but it's coming soon part two because last time it was coming soon 
uh, there was a chip shortage. We couldn't get to the chips necessary to build this board, but now we can. And so uh, we're starting to revive this. We just want to kind of bubble this up in people's consciousness. The Metro M7 featuring the IMX RT1011. It's a 500 megahertz a beast. Cortex <laughs> M7. Yeah, it's a bit of a beast. Although ironically, it doesn't have a ton of pins. Like you'd think, oh, there should be so many GPIO. It's actually exactly this many, just enough to do a Metro because um, a lot of those pins are for power or for you know SWD debugging. But um, we also hooked up an ESP32 on the left there as a Wi-Fi coprocessor. It's got STEM IQT, SWD um, debugging, a nine volt, nine to 12 volt DC input, reset button. Um, there is a built-in ROM bootloader that you can get into by switching those jumpers on the, uh, the switches on the boot select. Basically, we got these. Um, we got uh, we updated the flash to be that eight megabytes of QSPY because again, we we like eight megabytes. Um, we're basically going to be, you know, getting this to our developers. We're going to kind of resuscitate the efforts that we put in two years ago. Um, we did have Circuit Python running on this board quite well, and we just again couldn't get the chip anymore, and so we just shelved it. Um, but I think we're going to start getting into Cortex M7 now that um, they're available. They're a very exciting chipset. After this, we can follow up with other IMX chips as well, but we're starting with the low-cost IMX RT1011. Next up. Next up. Uh, it's now in stock uh, is the OV5640 camera module with 120-degree wide-angle lens. Um, we chatted about this earlier. It's you know a nice upgrade to the standard OV5640 camera or 2640 camera this is a you know very nice quality camera with a wide angle lens there's a couple updates that i did to the design to make it in my opinion a lot better than the standard um camera breakouts it has that two by nine header that every camera has it's got a jumper for the v motor pin if you have an autofocus camera module this one doesn't autofocus but you could swap in or we might release later a version of the autofocus. We have pull-ups on the I squared C lines. We've got a, a you know small light green LED to tell you that it's powered on. Uh, you've got optional internal clock generation for 24 megahertz clock if you don't want to spare a GPIO pin to do it. Uh, it's got you know pull up and pull down on enable and power down as necessary, so it kind of boots up immediately. It's got a little heat sinking area up top. Some of the camera modules we've noticed uh, can get a little toasty. So giving it that exposed gold area, you know, you can um, attach a tiny heat sink if you need even more um, heat sinking on, on that module. And I thought I'd, I'd show a little demo of this board. So the only thing I want to note is that this board is, um, can you go to the, okay. Peace. this board, it does have, you know, this two by nine connector. And we added, um, you know, in this case, I soldered both pins on, but we added another row. So you could plug this, you know, if you didn't solder in the second row, like I did, like if you had it like this, you could plug it into a breadboard. And um, because you know it's very hard to plug in a uh, dual row because you have to have like some sort of like divider or thingy that brings the pins apart. Um, but it's meant to go on boards like this Kaluga, which is an ESP32 uh, dev kit. Here, let me bring this out a little bit. Um, this dev kit, which has a camera connector, and a lot of dev boards, if they have one of these two by nine connectors, it's made, meant for a camera. So uh, plug it in and then let me see power. Let me see if this boots up and get my live demo going. You can do it live demo. Okay. So this is the circuit Python code, which grabs a camera frame and you can see I'm, I'm waving in front of the camera. Hello, hi, this is us. This is where we live. It's the bassinet. Um, so this, this camera module, you know, it's a nice wide angle. You can see it kind of distorts on the side just because it's you know, doing that wide angle uh, distortion to get um, the full frame and it's a little rounded at the tops uh, with the, the corners of the room. Um, but this is the, you know, CircuitPython code uh, just displaying it on 320 by 240. And then of course you can download it. Autojet creates JPEGs if, if desired. We have code to do that to capture a, a JPEG image. You can make image. your own digital camera. You can make your own digital camera. So we're going to start with the OV5640, but we'll also have versions with different lenses, autofocus 2640. But this is the, you know, this is the camera lens I kind of like the most. It's a great starter lens. Um, and I wanted to get, you know, this, this breakout, which again is the standard breakout for cameras. Uh, well established. Uh, yeah, Hi, we can bring screen Wait, down this. I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Um, 
Start the show besides you, Lady Ada, our entire team, and... Oh, I have a blank screen here. Look. Hi. <laughs> it's the void. Um, it's the Floppy Featherwing. It's here. It's here, finally. Yes, again, we're getting to... Oh. Uh, what? You, uh, that's the... Deep Man, thing. I keep... I keep you, no, because you clicked yeah, about the rope. Okay, Sorry. so anyways. Okay. The start of the show besides you, Lady Ada, our community, our customers... And everyone else, yay! Yeah, this is yeah. Well, this show is huge. There's a lot going on you here. Can't, you can't, you can't. So, read this show because it's so yeah. Weird. You can tell it's live. Okay. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, okay. Floppy feather wing. So we're gonna do more floppy stuff. But we want to start with the floppy feather wing just to get some. You know, basically the wiring of floppy drives is the toughest. So, floppy drives, PC floppy drives are not Apple floppy drives we support. These are also not you know, um, Commodore sixty four. This is for standard PC. You know. Classic PC 3.5, 5.25 inch floppy drives. They use this 34 pin IDC cable, two by 17 pins. One row is ground, but the other row is like all the GPIO that are used to communicate with the floppy drive. And floppy drives are very, very low level. So you, you do need to have, um, first off, they have to be five volts signal because the floppy disk is really expecting five volt signal. So on the floppy feather wing is level shifters uh, to and from the data. So um all of it is is converted to and from five volts to 3.3 volts and then oh let's show the back because it has the pins so uh, there's a lot of gpio used for floppy uh so you see from the bottom index step direction enable um d enable i don't remember what d enable is uh select your motor select uh and then um above right uh data uh right gate uh, protect, track zero, read, side, and uh, channel. And I think, I, I'm hopefully I'm getting all those right. There's a lot of uh, signals on the floppy drives. So they're, they all go to individual pins on the floppy, is on the floppy feather wing, and then are level shifted into the feather. So the thing about the feather is data that comes from the floppy streams out very, very quickly, and you can't really just use any chip you want. You really want something with a lot of RAM. And... Um, very fast GPIO, especially something that has like a DMA GPIO that you can stream that the data transitions that just like pour out of the floppy drive into RAM. And so for that, the best use case, in our opinion, is to use an RP2040. You could also use a Feather M4, although right now uh, it's hard to get the SAM 51 chips. So honestly, we're kind of saying just go with the RP2040. Um, you'll need to pair that with this and then run the software that we have uh, written. So maybe if you go back to us, because I have to explain a couple more okay. things. Okay, so um, there's three use cases for the floppy feather wing. One, you want to archive floppy disks and save them for like later perusal, maybe because you know you have disks from your childhood um, or you're archiving you know historical documents or whatever, you have the prints floppy, you want to get the data off. So you would use the floppy feather wing with the rp2040 and you use our firmware and this desktop software called grease weasel or flux engine to read those raw fluxes off and then you could do data correction if necessary like bit error correction and then convert that um that image uh into you know whatever format it is or the ibm pc or even mac um you can do some mac formats as well the second option is we also have code for arduino and uh, Circuit Python, where you can treat it as a file system. You can like read the files off. Uh, you can even do some writing, although the writing is is kind of iffy. Um, that's tougher to do. But the reading, you can read data off of the floppy and kind of treat it just like a normal file system, uh, as if it was an SD card. Uh, so that's good for like retro projects where you want to like use the floppy as you know an interface to actually store data on because it's like cool and retro. And then the third option um, is uh, you want to make like weird music. So you want to control the floppy disk and you want to like make the motor go back and forth and like tick and click. And, and There's a lot work. of videos like that. There's a lot of videos which I linked to. Uh, so those are like the three main use cases um, for the floppy feather wing. But it's still, I got to say, you have to get a floppy disk and they're not new, right? They're, not, they're no longer made. Um, the floppy drives are no longer made. And you have to power the floppy drive separately. And those require like 5 volts or 5 volts and 12 volts multiple amps so you may need like an xc power supply so this is not like a super beginner board like you have to get a couple things going we'll try we're going to try to make it easier but the fact that you can't buy off the shelf floppy drives anymore to make it a little bit more complicated than other products where you know everything is available in the store okay um 
That's new product lady. New, 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 new,